a little after this reading, Adam was out with his two sons, Cain and Abel. Perhaps you've heard of those two guys. And they were just out tending to the fields, walking. And Cain asked his father, Dad, what was it like when you lived in that famous special garden? And so Adam began to describe the Garden of Eden to his two sons and started talking about the beautiful trees and the fruits and the plants and the animals and talking about how God himself would be there to walk among them. And as he talked, you could tell that Adam was fondly remembering. And so Abel spoke up and said, Dad, that garden of Eden, it sounds so amazing. Why did you have to leave again? Adam paused, took a big sigh and said, well, son, that was your mother's fault. She ate us out of house and home. It's an oldie but a goodie. Adam and Eve is probably one of the most famous stories in all of Scripture. Even people with very little knowledge of the Bible have probably heard of this story in Genesis chapter 3. And if you think about it, Adam and Eve are the ultimate scapegoats even for us today, aren't they? Because think about how many things we can blame on what they did in Genesis 3. For example, why is it that we have to grow old and eventually die? Whose fault is that? Adam and Eve. Why is it that the ground produces thistles and thorns and it's hard work, it's back aching work to toil? to till the soil. Whose fault is that? Adam and Eve. Whose fault is it that ladies have to have a lot of pain during childbirth? Adam and Eve. Whose fault is it that we have to wear clothing and not walk around in our birthday suits? Adam and Eve. We can blame a lot of things on Adam and Eve, but this scripture is more than just an excuse for us to find someone to blame for so many of our problems. This scripture is actually a promise. It is a promise that God has given. It is a promise that includes all of us. So right now, I want you to turn to someone, make eye contact, just find someone, say, hey neighbor. Hey neighbor. Adam and Eve screwed things up. But God had a plan. And that plan you. Thank you. All right, so we're going to get into Genesis chapter 3, but here's the thing. I'm going to guess most of you have probably heard this before. This probably wasn't the first time you're like, Adam and Eve, who's that? If it is, I'm, I think that's awesome. Just follow along with us. But here's the problem. Sometimes when a Bible story, when a piece of scripture is so familiar, we tend to just kind of tune things out because we said, yeah, I know it. I've heard it before. So my challenge for us this morning is, let's explore this scripture and ask some questions. Because one thing that I have found, and I have a feeling probably many of you who've read the Bible a few times over the years have found, is that every single time you read a piece of scripture, can new things pop out at you? Yes, because God uses his Holy Spirit to speak to us, and perhaps there's something you're even going through today that this ancient story will so we're going to go through this a little bit verse by verse, and we're going to ask some questions. So let's go back. So go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And we began with the first character in our story. And before we get to the woman, before we get to the man, who do we meet? The serpent. Now, who is the serpent most likely? Satan. It's the devil. All right, most biblical scholars agree that this isn't just some jerk snake in the garden. This is Satan himself. Now, if we look at the text, does it say the serpent is Satan? Does it say that? No. But we can go to some other passages, and we can find some more information that will help us draw this conclusion. So we're going to jump all the way to the very back of the Bible. If you want to turn there, you can, otherwise I'll have it up here. We're going to go to Revelation 12, 9, all right, the very last book of the New Testament, and look at Revelation 12, 9. The great dragon, this is Satan being described, was hurled down that ancient what? Serpent, Serpent called the yeah. devil or Satan who leads 
leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So right there, we see devil and what animal are put together? Serpent. All right, now go to Revelation 20, verse 2. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So we see in Revelation that serpent is synonymous with who? Satan, the devil. Those passages and other passages lead us to pretty much say with most accuracy that this serpent in the Garden of Eden is the devil. So, the question is that people ask, does that mean that Satan had always been a serpent in the Garden? And most likely, probably not. He was probably impersonating a serpent. We know in other passages about Satan, can he take different forms? Yes. Even, for example, 1 Peter describes the devil as a roaring lion. And if you know some of the other stories, especially from the New Testament, Satan's minions, his demons, could they possess a person? Yes. In fact, there's even a truly wild story where Jesus cast demons out of a person, and where do they go? Into which animal? To a, a herd of pigs. Demons and pigs. The Bible, the Bible is wild stuff. So we know Satan, he can, he can take different shapes. So most likely, he's impersonating the serpent, impersonating the snake. Now, go back to verse 1, Genesis 3, 1. Do you notice something interesting? Satan, impersonating the snake, comes up to the woman, who will later be called Eve, and what does Satan do? What is he doing? He's talking. Does Eve seem to be freaked out by that? No. She's just having a conversation with a talking snake. I don't know about you. I would probably not be as calm. So what does this tell us? Does this mean that at that point, all snakes could talk? Maybe. Could other animals talk? I don't know. Maybe it means that this is the first time Eve has ever encountered this creature, and so maybe she just figures, eh, the snake can talk. Doesn't seem to be a big deal. But what is the question that Satan, the serpent, that he asks? He said, did God really say? Did God really say? What is Satan doing with that did God really say? What is his strategy right here in this moment? Doubt. doubt. He's trying to get Eve to doubt. Did God really say? And here's the thing, friends. Guess what the devil's favorite strategy is today to try to get people to fall astray from God? Doubt. The same thing. What does that show us? The devil is not creative. He's kind of a one-trick serpent. And he's using this. Just think about that. Think about temptations that maybe you've fallen into. Perhaps for those of you that grew up in a church, you knew what was right and wrong. But what question did you sometimes find as you reached for something you shouldn't, as you went to something you shouldn't? Well, did God really say this wasn't that so bad? Would this really hurt someone? I think God's more of the, in the gray area about this. Do you see? He still uses the exact same trick. And why does he still use it? Because we still fall for it. It works, doesn't it? And that's what he's doing. He's putting that tiny, tiny seed of doubt into the woman's mind. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? Now, what is he getting at? He's not talking about all the trees, is he? He's talking about what tree? One tree. The tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if we go back a chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, this is when God instructs the man, Adam, about this tree. This is what God says in Genesis 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from which tree? Any tree in the garden. All right, that's verse 16. Now look at verse 17. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, I want you just to think about those two verses. All right? If you've got a Bible, you might just want to keep your finger on that page. We're going to flip back and forth. I want you to think about what God just said to Adam. And then let's go look at Genesis 3, verses 2 through 3. And I want you to pay attention. Remember, we're asking questions. Is what Eve is about to say to the serpent the same as what God just said? Let's take a look. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Now, hold on a second. Is that different? How did God refer to that tree? The tree of what? Knowledge of good and evil. How was Eve referring to that tree? The tree in the middle. He said, well, that's, that's not a big deal. It's just the location. But think about what she's doing. Is Eve downplaying the importance of that tree? Just think about that title. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree in the middle of the garden. <laughs> Which one sounds a little more intimidating? The actual name, right? The tree of knowledge. So she's downplaying it. You know what that's like? That's like if you live in a neighborhood, there's just this ferocious dog, maybe this giant Rottweiler, who's got the spike collar, it says killer on it. Now, I really like Rottweilers, but this is a bad one. Maybe foaming at the mouth, and every time somebody walks by, he tries to attack. And somebody comes up to his new neighbor and says, is there a dog over there? And he said, oh yeah, just some dog. <laughs> is that an accurate description? No. And that's what Eve is doing. She's not giving the real accurate description. Now notice the next part, though. What does she say? And you must not touch it, or you will die. Now look back at 2.16 through 17. Is that what God said? Did God say you can't touch the tree? No, what did he say? You can't what? Eat from the tree. You can't eat the fruit. As far as we know, you can hug the tree if you want. Why does Eve change that? Well, a couple hypotheses. Perhaps she changes it because... She's not really sure. Maybe she has bad information. And if Eve has bad information, who's to blame? Adam. Because who gave the instructions? Adam had the instructions. Who most likely Adam then took that and gave that to Eve. Which, you know what that means? It means that Eve had bad com communication with her husband. And I know, you're saying a man communicating badly to his wife? That's unheard of. But, perhaps... She doesn't know, or perhaps she's just kind of making up her own rules about this tree. Whatever it is, it's not the same. It's not the same. She's changing God's command. Now, the snake, the serpent, the devil, he knows he has that seed of doubt in Eve. And probably after Eve's response, downplaying the tree's name, changing God's words, he thinks, now I've got her on the hook. And let's look at the next couple verses. Verses 4 through 5. You will not certainly die, the servant said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like who? Who? God. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is also one of the devil's great strategies. Make humans think that we are equal with God. What he's basically saying is, you can be just like him. And now Eve is taking the bait. If we go to the next verse, verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, hold on a second. Let's ask a question here. Who was with her? Her husband. Now, <laughs> the picture we usually get is Eve and the snake are having a conversation, and then she takes the fruit, eats it, and then who does she bring it to? Have you ever seen that before? Maybe like in a picture book or cartoon? It's like Eve and the snake having this private moment. By the tree, she takes a fruit and brings it to him. But when we look at the text, who's right by her side as she's picking the fruit? Adam, which makes some biblical scholars believe 
that Adam possibly could have been there for this entire conversation. Especially if you look it back into the Hebrew, the you, the pronoun you that the serpent uses is actually a plural. Possibly meaning there's more than one person standing there. Now, if Adam was not there in the initial conversation, he was there, we just read that, as she walks up to the tree, the tree that he also had the command, right? He knows you're not supposed to eat the fruit. He's right there as she picks the fruit. He's right there as she sinks her teeth into the fruit. She's, he's right there as she hands him the fruit. So if you want to say, Adam is not responsible, I'm going to tell you, he's responsible. He, at any point, could have said, that is wrong. We need to back away. Don't listen to the snake. We need to listen to God. But Adam was silent. He was silent the entire time. He went along with it. If this was a crime, what would we call him? An accomplice. Right? He went along with it. And so, they both eat the fruit, and we look at verse 7. And then what happened? The eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. Now, there's some interesting theories about this moment. Some have argued that perhaps before this moment, the light of God kind of shone around them, kind of blurred everything out. I think that's a little strange, but, you know, anything's possible. But most likely, what happens as they eat that fruit, as they disobey God, they're filled with, what's our word of the day? Shame. They feel shame. And that's why they realize that they're naked, that they're standing there in the garden, and they have no clothes on. And so what do they do? They go and get some fig leaves, and they sew them together, and they make coverings for themselves. I think that's an interesting choice of clothing. Fig leaves have got to be incredibly itchy. I would have looked for the velvet tree, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> and then, verse 8, what happens? <laughs> the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And then what did they do from God? What did they do? They hide. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hide from God because they're so filled with guilt and so filled with shame. Now, what happens next? There's going to be consequences. Right? First, there's going to be this blame game. Right? Adam points the finger at Eve. Eve points the finger at the snake. Then there's going to be consequences. And those are all the things we talked about before. The things that we, even today, can blame Adam and Eve for. I want to focus less on the consequences for Adam and Eve and all of us. And instead, I want to focus on that serpent just for a moment. So we're going to jump ahead to verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. And you will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. So, because of this, the first consequence for the serpent, are people going to love the serpent? No, it's going to be cursed. And one of the parts of being cursed is what's going to happen? How is he going to transport? He's going to what? Crawl on his belly, which makes us ask the question, and we're asking questions. What did serpents look like before this? Could they fly? Could they have four legs? We don't know. But we know now the serpent is going to be crawling on his belly. And because the serpent is crawling on his belly, God says you're going to be eating something. What are you going to be eating? Dust. Eating dust. Now, do you think that's a positive or a negative? Definitely a negative. Maybe you've ever been in a competition like a race, and you're next to someone, and have you ever said the words or heard the words, get ready to eat my dust. Have you ever said that? Heard that? All right. Some of you said, yeah, I was fat. I said, oh, okay. all right. Eating dust. Is that the winner or the loser? That's the loser. So what is God telling? Not the snake, but remember, who is the snake? Actually, it's the devil. He's telling the devil, you are going to eat dust. You are going to taste defeat. I mean, literally, think about it. The snake is crawling on the ground. He's tasting defeat all the time. <laughs> but you are 
okay to some of you getting it. I see it. All right. <laughs> you're tasting dust because you're not the winner. You're not the victor. You are the loser. You will lose, Satan. And then he goes to verse 15. And if you want to highlight, circle, star, underline a verse, I would highly recommend 15. He says, this is the Lord God, and I will put enmity, enmity, opposition, hostility, conflict between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Now, I know we have some people in this church who love snakes, and I'm, there's nothing wrong with that. I like snakes. But for those of you that don't like snakes, that's your verse, isn't it? Amen. That is your verse. You're like, yep, see, it's biblical. It is biblical. <laughs> Especially ladies, my wife met, she does not enjoy snakes. She would say that's her verse. That is why. That is why she sees a snake, she's going the other way. But this isn't just about snakes, is it? No. Because the snake is actually Satan. And what's he saying? That the woman and Satan are going to be in opposition? No. But the offspring. Her offspring. Now, here's something very interesting. This word offspring, if you go back to the Hebrew, can also be translated as seed. So let's just change that real quick, and we'll put in between your seed and hers. So, what did that just say? The woman's seed. Now, if you know a little bit about biology, anatomy, is that a strange combination? The woman's seed. Yes. All right, if you don't know anything about anatomy, normally the seed is, goes to which gender? The male. And actually in other biblical passages, it will talk like this. So what is the woman's seed? That doesn't biologically make sense. How can a woman have a seed when normally the seed is referred to as the male? Well, a famous theologian, scholar, sauerkraut enthusiast named Martin Luther once wrote about this. And I want to share his quote with you. This is his commentary on Genesis. Remember, Luther lived in the 1500s, so this is over 500 years ago, and this is what Luther said. Women give birth to children up to the flood and afterwards up to Mary, but their seed could not have been truly called the seed of woman. Rather, it was the seed of man, that which is born out of Mary. However, was conceived by the Holy Ghost and is truly Mary's seed. All right, are you putting that together? Remember, the sooner you get it, the sooner we get to be done. <laughs> <laughs> what is Luther and other biblical scholars saying? That this is called the seed of the woman because thousands of years later, a young woman named Mary is going to get pregnant in a way that the world has never seen. Who will be the father of her child? It's not Joseph, it's God. She is going to have the Son of God. And in order for her to have the Son of God, the seed comes from the Holy Spirit. We call it the Immaculate Conception. That is how the woman sees Is 
the promise. That's why Genesis 3 is more than just a blame game. Genesis 3 is the first gospel because God says, I know you messed up. I know you just fell into sin. I know things are going to change, but I'm here. I love you, and I have a promise for you. And one day I will send the offspring of the woman. shared with you before, I grew up on a dairy farm in rural Oregon, and literally my grandparents lived across the pasture. And most, I spent a lot of time with my grandma and grandpa growing up, and my grandma was our primary babysitter. I had two younger brothers. And often we'd be at grandma's house, so she'd come to our house. And one of the things that I remember as a very young child uh, playing with my grandma, we played lots and lots of games was we play hide and seek. I'm sure some of you have played some hide and seek with grandkids or with other people. Hide and seek is a classic game. And one of the great things about playing hide and seek with my grandmother was she was terrible. My grandma might have been the worst seeker in the history of the world. And I remember as a very young boy, my grandparents at the time were living in the farmhouse which we would later move into. Uh, in my grandparents' bedroom, there was this set of cupboards. They were cupboards that were built into the wall. And there was like a shelf, and then at the very top, there was this fairly good-sized cupboard. And so grandma was counting, and I, at probably four or five years old, decided, where's a good place to hide? The cupboard up there. So I used these long, monkey arms of mine, and I just climbed right up that shelf, got in the cupboard, closed the door. I was in that cupboard at least 20 minutes. <laughs> Grandma walked by so many times, and I just kept quiet. And I am here to tell you, if I hadn't opened that cupboard door, I think I'd still be in there today. <laughs> Grandma had no idea. She had no idea where I was. I share this with you because if we go back to Genesis chapter 3, what do Adam and Eve do after they fall into sin and they make some fig leaf clothing? What do they do? They hide. They go and hide. And then God comes into the garden, and look at verse 9. What is it that God asked? But the Lord God called to the man, what does he ask? Where are you? Where are you? Have you ever wondered why God asked that question? Because, friends, God's not my grandma. God is an expert at hide and seek. If you look at God's record of playing hide and seek, he's undefeated. Because he knows all things. Does he know where Adam and Eve are? Yes. Wherever they're hiding, he built the bush. He knows they're there. So why does he ask? Why does he say, where are you? What's the point? Why is he asking? Because when God asks a question, who's it for? When he asks questions in Scripture, who is it for? Is it for God to get information? No. It's for who? Us, his people. And he asked that question of Adam and Eve because what he's saying is, Adam and Eve, I know you've done the wrong thing, but I want you to come to me. Where are you? Could also be, Adam, Eve, do the right thing. Come to me. Come to your father. Come to your creator. Come to me and find comfort. Don't hide. Come to me. I share that question with you today because, friends, that's the question we're asking ourselves today. Where are you? Where are you this morning? Yeah, I know. I know you're here at 319-1. I 
Mike Pike Airport Road. But where are you in your journey this morning? Where are you in your relationship with God? Where are you right now? Are you feeling like you need to hide? Or maybe you've been hiding for a while and your mind is starting to come out and you're saying, I don't know. I don't know if this is for me. Do you feel like you're unworthy for the God of heaven and earth to walk beside you? Do you think, God, I've just screwed up so many times. You don't want any of this. Because he's asking you that question. He's saying, where are you? Where are you, my child? Stop hiding and come to me. I don't know all your stories. I don't know your struggles that you're going through. But I know that there have been times in my life where I pulled an Adam and Eve and I wanted to just hide because I feel shame. I feel guilt. And there's that part of me that just says, God, you don't want this. You don't want this damaged person. I know I'm not good enough. Just God saying, where are you? Come to me. Where are you? Come to me. So this morning, I want to let you know that if you're struggling with that question, if you feel like you're hiding from God, maybe you've been up and down in your relationship with faith, I want you to know that the answer is come to him. Go to him. Come out of hiding and go to him. He loves you. If we look back at the story in Genesis, did he love Adam and Eve? Absolutely. He loved them so much. And he wasn't willing to let them just fall into sin and leave them behind. He gave them a promise. A promise that you and I have seen fulfilled through his son Jesus on that cross. So where are you this morning? Where are you? Because the Lord of heaven and earth is saying, come to me. Stop hiding. Stop hiding parts of your life from me. Come to me. Stop hiding and come to me. And maybe there's someone today as we read this and we think about this, that's who you're thinking of. You're thinking of someone who's maybe in a bit of hiding. Maybe they're in a hidden season right now. And I would just invite you as we get ready to finish service, sing our last song, to just pray for that person. So right now, would you just close your eyes? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that we cannot ever be hidden from you. We thank you that you are a God of love, mercy, and grace. We thank you for your son, Jesus, with a promise fulfilled for each and every one of us. And right now, Lord, if there is someone here who is struggling, if someone just feels ashamed, they feel guilt has pulled them down, maybe decisions in their past are heavy on their heart this morning, will you help them to know that you love them, that Jesus died for them, and that you want them to come to you? Help them, Lord, to take that step today, a step toward you, a step to say, Lord, I need you, I want you, tired of hiding. I need you. Will you just give them the courage today to do that? To just walk to you? We also, Lord, we feel, we feel the pain of people that we know that we love who perhaps are hidden. People who are far from you at this moment. Lord, would you open their eyes? Would you let your Holy Spirit go to work? Would you use us in some small way to be a light to them, to let them know that you are there, that they don't need to hide, that they don't need to be ashamed, that you sent your son for the shame and the guilt, for the mistakes and the failures, that you sent your son to crush the serpent's head, that you are a God who knows how to win. You are a God who is victorious through your son, Jesus. Ask, Lord, that you would be with that person, that person on our heart this morning, the person that you know that you love who is your child, that you would be with them and help them to walk to you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that we have a serpent-crushing, devil-stomping Savior. In him we put our trust today. In his holy and precious and mighty name, we pray.